morning. I'm Kenneth Polanski, Dean of the Biological Sciences Division and the Pritzker School of Medicine. And I'm delighted to be here today with all of you, your family and friends, to celebrate your accomplishments as you graduate from the University of Chicago. Obviously, these are unique circumstances, and I miss the opportunity to participate in the hooding ceremony and to congratulate each of you individually as you receive your graduation certificates. The current situation enhances the significant, significance of what you have all achieved and underscores the importance of the careers that lie ahead of you. The coronavirus pandemic and its consequences highlights an, in an urgent and dramatic way the absolutely essential role played by medicine and biomedical science in maintaining the health of our population. Although there are many points of disagreement concerning the origin and response to this pandemic, there are at least two issues on which there is general agreement. The first is that the medical and other health professions and health workers across the world have responded to this crisis in extraordinary ways that have earned universal respect and admiration. We have seen abundant evidence of this in our own hospital, where our healthcare teams have provided the highest levels of care to our patients, despite significant personal risks. Our hospital has taken care of amongst the most COVID-19 patients of any hospital in the state of Illinois, and we have gone to great lengths to ensure that our patients have access to the highest level of care through meticulous clinical protocols, clinical trials, and other innovative approaches to treatment. The second area on which there is general agreement is how essential it is for biomedical science to develop novel and hopefully definitive solutions to preventing and treating COVID-19. The unmet needs are enormous. We need to develop better mathematical models and epidemiologic approaches to contain the spread of the virus. We need more accurate tests that can detect early onset disease soon after exposure before symptoms have developed and more sensitive quantitative tests of the antibody response that allow us to accurately predict who has immunity and who is still susceptible. Remdesivir, the only drug that has been shown to be effective against the coronavirus, must be given intravenously and has only been studied in people with severe advanced disease. We clearly need additional therapies that can be used early on after exposure to prevent the development of severe disease and that can be taken by mouth. And of course, there is an enormous amount of hope being placed in the ability of basic science to develop an effective vaccine that will prevent COVID-19. Advances along these lines would have a transformative impact on our ability to control this outbreak and prevent additional outbreaks in the future. We all recognize that without these and other scientific breakthroughs, the devastating human and economic consequences of this infection will be felt for many years to come. What is also clear is that these breakthroughs will need to come primarily from basic scientists who understand the biology of the virus, the pathways that offer the best targets for therapeutic intervention, the nature of the immune response and how to make it more effective in stopping the growth of the virus. And of course, basic scientists will need to work with physicians and epidemiologists, medicinal chemists and other translational scientists to turn basic scientific knowledge into innovative new approaches to prevention and treatment. These are a daunting set of challenges and I hope that many of you will be inspired by these events to contribute new knowledge that helps solve these problems. Of course, COVID-19 is just one example where the application of basic scientific approaches can lead to dramatic improvement in the human condition. And we would point to similar opportunities for scientific advancement in cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, and heart disease, to name just a few. You are graduating at an historic time, filled with great opportunity, but also great challenge. I know you will rise to the challenges ahead and take full advantage of the skills that your rigorous scientific training has provided you. I would like to say how much we have enjoyed having you as students in the Biological Sciences Division at the University of Chicago. It has been a privilege to participate in your education. We are proud of your accomplishments and wish you everything of the best in your future careers. Thank you.
I am so deeply honored to have been asked to help celebrate your PhD at the University of Chicago. A PhD is so many things, a marathon effort, work towards a single goal, an accomplishment that took determination, grit, creativity, and passion. You might not have realized this during your long hours at the bench, under the microscope, on the computer, or in the field, but your achievements, your qualities, your training reflect so deeply upon you and make you so very needed in the years ahead. In this spirit, I want to explore my own PhD decades ago and to try to find a common theme for all of us during these uncertain times. The initiation to my own life's work was deeply unauspicious. I went to graduate school to study paleontology and embryology, to understand the great transitions in the history of life, such as when mammals evolved into reptiles and fish evolved to walk on land. During my first year in my graduate program, I received a huge opportunity. I was one of the invitees to a field expedition headed to the deserts of northern Arizona, a land of mesas, buttes, and barren red rock. Exploring these rocks was our goal. We were sent there to find 200 million year old fossils and hopefully some of the earliest mammals in the fossil record. Typically, fossils just erode out of the rock, so you spend days walking and scanning the rock surfaces for the fossil bones and teeth that emerge as it weathers out. Not knowing much about finding fossils myself, I shadowed one of the seasoned veterans on the team, a gritty and crusted old man named Chuck, who had spent the better part of 40 years on expeditions of one kind or another. Chuck was generous with his time, and for days we walked the vast plains together looking at the rocks on the surface. For several weeks, Chuck talked about and discovered fossils at our feet, while I found absolutely nothing. I returned home each day empty-handed. Where Chuck saw bones, all I saw was dirt and, and rock. With the growing frustration of each passing day, I remember asking Chuck how he finds bones. What do they look like? What kinds of cues he uses to recognize them? He described his methods, but for the life of me, I could not understand them. And to add some insult to injury, he was picking up bones, sometimes with my own boot print nearby. Then one day I saw it, a brilliant piece of bone that sparkled in the light. It was a tooth, and the way it glittered was different from every other rock I had seen to that point. As I looked around, I saw more teeth and more bone. Suddenly, it was as if the entire desert floor opened up in front of me. I felt as if I was wearing a new pair of glasses. Bones were everywhere. My fossil turned out to be a jaw of an ancient mammal-like animal. This was the first time I had seen bones on the surface. But actually, I had been looking at them for weeks. What was mere rock to my eyes just days before was now fossil bone. What changed? The thing that changed was my ability to see. I had learned to find fossils by seeing the world around me in a whole new way. And in different ways, that process happens to each of us in science. Whether we work in the field, in the lab, with patients, or in front of a computer, our discoveries, experiments, and models give us new ways of seeing. We learn to see connections, mechanisms, and relationships that were invisible to us before. But learning to see has an unexpected corollary. It also means knowing how much we are blind. There's a profound analogy from physics. The light we see in a range of colors from red to green to blue is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This spectrum extends from gamma rays and x-rays to microwaves and radio signals, and it spans a range of wavelengths over tens orders of magnitude. The light that we see with our eyes is but an infinitesimally small sliver of that range. We see only 0.0035% of all of it. Think about that for a second. Our eyes are blind to over 99% of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is a metaphor for the times. We live in an age when people talk of alternative facts, fake news, and junk science. Those adjectives, alternate, fake, junk, make it ever more important that we gain and take a cold look at marshalling and evaluating evidence in making decisions. And doing that means confronting our own very human limitations. Experiments have shown that cognitive biases make us blind to most ideas, concepts, and opinions that lie out there. Indeed, behavioral scientists have a huge taxonomy of the kinds of biases that to affect our ability to see clearly and make correct decisions. With names like group attribution error, false consensus effect, and halo effect, among dozens of others, these biases reveal that however rational we think we are, in many cases, we are anything but. Our biases, expectations, and emotional states limit us every bit as much, perhaps even more, than the light receptors in our eyes. We humans fill the unknown with many things. As a graduate student in the biological sciences, you've learned to fill the unknown as a scientist with hypotheses, evidence, and discovery. But as you can see in the world around you, 
Many fill the unknown with fear, suspicion, conspiracies, partisan opinion, and prior expectation and biases. A quick glance, glance at the news or social media will reveal that. But we scientists are not immune to these failings as well. Coronavirus has put many of our very human failings under a sharp lens. We must remain vigilant to keep open minds and focus on what evidence tells us, where we remain uncertain, and what evidence we still need to collect. Right now, we are witnessing science in accelerated real time. Since the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was released in January, we've seen science that would normally happen over months or years transpire over weeks, even days. Tests, therapies, and vaccines are being developed at a breakneck pace. I, for one, remain deeply optimistic that science will beat the virus and the disease. With all of humanity focused on it, I think it's a matter of when and not if we will emerge from this threat. But with all this rapid science, we have a public that is increasingly bewildered. Scientific papers are announced on preprint servers and social media prior to peer review, and we see conflicting data changing facts almost daily. Today's dogmas are occasionally next week's dead ends or false leads. But this is the natural process of scientists. What's different now is that it's happening at warp speed under full public view. In this ever-changing landscape, it is often impossible to keep our expectations, hopes, fears, and emotional states from preferring certain kinds of evidence and outcomes more than others. And that's where a key lesson of scientific training comes into crystal clear focus. What science teaches us about the way forward? Humility. Humility in the face of evidence, and importantly, humility in the face of changing evidence. Humility to face, and most importantly, to recognize what we don't know about the universe, what we don't know about other living, other living things, and most importantly, what we don't know about each other. And importantly, the humility to change our minds in the face of new evidence. These are decidedly unpopular values these days, but they have never been more urgent and important. I hope that your time in the biological sciences at the University of Chicago has cultivated your appreciation for the importance of evidence, that is, it enhanced your ability to see what is important to you and has helped you cultivate the kind of humility that is necessary to change with the times and always continue to learn to see. Earning a PhD is a monumental achievement. As with any large undertaking, you've likely experienced a full range of successes, challenges, ups and downs along the way. But it now comes for you at a key moment. You are leaving graduate school to enter a world that has never needed trained scientists like yourself more. You have the training, the capacity, and the ability to make the world a better place in whatever way you can. I hope that you can find that path and discover joys along the way. Congratulations all. Graduates of 2020, congratulations. And congratulations also to your family and friends who've supported you through your graduate school experience. By completing your PhD, the highest degree awarded, you have generated new knowledge and made new discoveries in the biological sciences. Now I know that the natural world does not give up its secrets easily. So this means you have put many long days over multiple years into this endeavor. I hope that now you've reached the end of this hard won process, you'll take the time both to reflect upon your achievements and to celebrate them. Although you graduate into a world that none of us could have predicted just a few short months ago, the determination and the tenacity that carried you through the rigors of dissertation research will serve you well and allow you to thrive going forward. I wish you the very best of fortune in your future career, and I hope that you'll stay connected with us as you move on to the next stage. Once again, my heartfelt congratulations to you all. <laughs>